All right, we're going to do another round of questions, starting again with Mr. Pollard. In a recent interview with Bill Nemitz on March 4th, you said you believe this, quote, this spring is the time for the U.S. to launch strikes, end quote, against Iran. Pentagon officials and Obama administration officials say that strikes against Iran should be a last resort. Can you explain why you think we should be bombing Iran right now? I, I cannot explain that because I've actually changed my position on that. Um, and I did have a, an interview on, on PBN in which I discussed the fact that I had changed that position. I can't explain what I was thinking at the time, which is that I had read a report that was issued by the Bipartisan Policy Center, um, the National Security Project, which said that for, briefly, and I only have a few seconds here, but, um, and this is a complex issue, um, that were Iran to develop a nuclear weapon, that Israel and Iran would be in a Cuban Missile-like, crisis-like state of detente, <coughs> both sides would have the, the strong incentive to strike first. And basically, this is a center founded by Senator Mitchell, two, uh, Senator Daschle, Senator Robb, and Senator Dole, who were all former House Senate Majority Leaders, they came to the conclusion that it's absolutely unacceptable for Iran to develop a nuclear weapon. And at that time, Israel was talking very seriously about making an attack. And my feeling was it would be much easier for Iran to retaliate against Israel. Um, whereas if America said, we can't allow you to take this, and I did say in that interview, we should issue a warning first that if you don't disband, which didn't make it in the column, if you don't disband your nuclear program, then we would attack, and I thought that wouldn't work. I am now much more dovish, and I hope, I only have 15 seconds, but if you can listen to my interview on NPBM, I, I go into more detail about this. It's on the website. Thank you, Mr. Paul. Um, Mr. Dunlap, in your answers to the lead questionnaire, you expressed very strong opposition to specific counterterrorism policies adopted by the Obama administration, such as indefinite detention of terrorism suspects, the extrajudicial execution of American citizens, and the use of military tribunals to try terrorism suspects. Are you now willing to publicly express opposition to these Obama counterterrorism policies and continue to oppose them throughout your campaign if and once elected? Yes. Either you're going to be part of a nation that stands up for the rule of law, or you're not going to be part of a nation that stands up for the rule of law. And I think that the whole premise of the American Republic has been uh, equal justice for all. And I do not believe that the counterterrorism tactics that you have mentioned in your question are effective. They, uh, they certainly have, have not prevented acts of terrorism in the past. I don't believe in things like domestic spying, the, uh, the, 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 the detentions in Guantanamo Bay. Uh, if these people are truly criminals, they should be tried as criminals, and they should not simply be held in limbo indefinitely in defiance of the law. Um, and I can never support such activity on, on any type of elongated basis. And history has shown that, uh, that such practices really uh, yield no favorable results for those who practice them. So I think we need to stay to our principles and uh, make sure that everyone who is brought before us is, is, as, as an aggressor is treated as anyone who would appear in, in a court. I, I didn't read a second part of it because the, the question I asked was big enough, but there is a second part to this question. I'm just going to throw it in here. Um, you also said that extrajudicial executions of American citizens is a violation of the Constitution. So do you believe that President Obama is in violation? Um, I'm, not a, I'm not a judge, and I think it's some, <coughs> important to understand that uh, interpretations of what constitutes constitutionality really is left to those on the bench. However, it is my opinion as a citizen that such, such acts are outside of the, of the scope of the Constitution, yes. Thank you. Okay. We'll second question. Um, candidate Cynthia Dill, um, in your League of Young Voters questionnaire, you stated it was acceptable to benefit from super PACs because, quote, these are the rules and candidates need to be competitive, end quote. Can you describe a situation in which you took money from a PAC and used it in a way to benefit your constituents? Well, some of you joined me in my protest of President Obama at the museum where I was selling super PACs of lobster cookies. Um, to benefit the Pearl Street Research
resource center. And that was my statement, somewhat political theater, of my objection to the current state of affairs when it comes to money and politics. If I'm elected to the United States Senate, I will support campaign reform. I support uh, public federal elections. I also support the Disclose Act. I'm trying to think. In this election, I have been endorsed by two PACs. One is WAN, the Women's Advancement for New Directions, and they have sent me a check for $500, and I've used that money to do everything that you need to do um, for a campaign. Um, I've never accepted money from, at least that I can recall, from a PAC um, in my uh, life as a legislator. I could be forgetting I did have a leadership PAC, but I don't recall ever accepting money from uh, a PAC. But I would like to think that what I do on a day-to-day -day basis benefits my constituents. Thank you very much. All right, um, candidate uh, Mr. Pink. In response to our question about combating student loan debt, you suggested an increase in Pell Grant funding, yet the majority of students saddled with debt are ineligible for that program. How exactly would you increase this funding, and what steps do you propose the Senate take to reduce costs of higher education for students that still won't qualify for Pell Grants, yet face a minimum of at least $20,000 in student loan debt? And what steps can Congress take to alleviate students' existing debt? I guess I get the uh, budget question. So um, <laughs> what I'm uh, going to say, depart for a second, uh, I've agreed with a lot of what's been said here today, but uh, even before the applause, I was so taken with what uh, Matt Dunlop had to say in his last answer that I wanted to second that. Um, on the question of Pell Grants, uh, much harder. Uh, I, I'll give that question to Matt if he wants it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think we could, we could expand the eligibility for Pell Grants or have uh, similar programs, but um, I've already described uh, my awareness of the difficult budget situation that uh, the nation has faced, and I would be careful not to uh, pander just because I'm talking to the League of Young Voters and say that any senator can go down to Washington and make education a lot cheaper for people today. I do think we need uh, significant education overhaul. I've been wondering whether some of it would come not from government direction, but from a change in the way that the colleges and universities operate. Uh, it seems to me that, um, that uh, there ought to be uh, uh, choices that include universities that remain and colleges that remain excellent in education and maybe not offer uh, some of the broad arrays of things that colleges feel they have to do to be competitive. Now, I did just find out that Bowdoin College has, uh, is ranked as having some of the best food in the country, and I would hate to talk about that. I think it's fantastic that Maine-based school would have uh, uh, be known for having good food. But I'm talking about um, some of the uh, some of the facilities that uh, uh, traditionally colleges didn't have. Anyhow. Thank you.